Okay. So the next one, and probably one of the more common types of statistics you'll see if you're reading journal articles and stuff, is a t-test. The simplest and easiest t-test is a single sample t-test. You use a single sample t-test when the null hypothesis's population mean is known, but not the population standard deviation. So, for example, let's say that I knew that the mean of the United States and IQ scores was 100, but I didn't know what the standard deviation was. For some reason, I didn't have all of them, or who knows, the paper got lost, who knows, right? What do you guys think you might do in such a situation? So we've got this circumstance, we're pulling these guys out, right? We know we have our sample, we can measure things in our sample, but we don't know this important piece of information that we need about the population. What do you think you might do? Run the screen, you could do that. Estimate. Yeah, you could estimate it, right? Assuming that our, that our sample isn't that different from our population, the mean might be different, right? That's what we're testing. But probably the variance is about the same, right? It's an assumption, right? We don't know. But <coughs> if you're in this situation, we're going to have to estimate if we want to do the same types of, of, of tests, right? So the population standard deviation is estimated from the sample standard deviation. Which, by the way, maybe a few of you are perking up. That sounds like kind of risky business, right? How do you know? How do you know that the population standard deviation is anywhere near the sample standard deviation? Um, the first answer is you don't. It's an assumption. Um, but the sort of better answer is the t-tests are just less sensitive. Right? More or less, the math tries to take account for the fact that you don't actually know it. It tries to say, OK, you're estimating something, so you now have more noise in what you're doing. Right? Therefore, we're going to make it even harder for you to get these improbable estimates. Does that make sense? The statistics sort of take that into account, is all I'm trying to say. So in order to do this, you'll notice this equation looks just like the last one, except for now rather than sigma, at the bottom, the standard error of the mean of the population, you'll notice there's an S. Right? The reason for that is because we're now going to use the standard deviation of our sample to estimate the standard deviation of our population. So S here is, I mean, you, I don't want to say it's the standard deviation of the sample, because it's not quite right. S is our estimated standard deviation of the population from the standard deviation of our sample. Yes? Why wouldn't this be a case where you would know the population mean, but not the standard deviation? One, so one really good case comes up here in a minute. And would, so it would be weird, right? It would be kind of weird, and this isn't all that common in research that you see the single sample. Um, I don't know of any example off the top of my head where, where something like this would be the case. Um, one place where I can't think that it happens is in parasitical t-tests, which is you give someone a test, you give them a cup of coffee, and then you give them a post-test. And you want to know, did the coffee help them, right? In a within-subject design, if the coffee didn't help them, you would imagine that the difference between pre-test and post-test on average would be zero, right? In that case, when you're using different scores like that, the difference between one and another in a subject, the population mean is zero. So you know the population is zero by assumption because that's what it would be if there were no effect, which is your normal hypothesis. Is that clear? I know it's sort of a convoluted roundabout explanation, but that's one specific case I can imagine this happening. I, I mean, top of my head, we don't generally do t-tests anyways. You run ANOVAs and stuff. Um, but it helps because what this does is it's a stepping stone to where we want to get, which is independent samples t-tests, which is what you more generally would use anyways. So, right. So the difference here, again, don't worry about all the math. I don't want you guys worrying about the math. It's not a huge deal. The main thing I would point out here is just like with the z-tests, notice how we calculate standard error of the mean is just standard deviation of our population divided by the sample, square root of the sample size, right? We're doing the same thing here, but we're using the standard deviation. So if you look at the second equation in, we're using the standard deviation of our sample divided by our sample size. So it's the same basic calculation. And you might notice, too, if you follow it to the next one, 
that that expands out into the same basic formula with which we calculated variance, well, standard deviation, in the population, right? You guys see the difference? What's the difference between this and how we did it for a population? What's the difference between how you calculate SX? It's what? Minus 1. Yeah, you guys all see that n minus 1 in the denominator? If it were sigma for the population, that's just an n. The whole point of that, well, there's a couple of reasons for it. Just think about it this way. We have to do that to correct for the fact that it's just an estimate that we didn't actually know the right value. Does that make sense? Again, you don't have to know the formula, but I just want you to see that they're basically the same, but you have to sort of do these little tricks as you start estimating more things. Is everyone clear on the single sample? Just like a z-test, except for we have to estimate the population standard deviation because we don't have it. All right, ready? Here we go. This is the one you actually will see a lot more. Single sample, yeah, it's like a toy test. I can't, I can't imagine a, a situation where I've actually seen one done, except for in stats class. Um, but it helps to build up the logic for this next one, which is the independent samples. So you use independent samples when neither the null hypothesized population mean or standard deviation is known. I put that in brackets. I feel like it's kind of awkward, the null hypothesis population mean. Only because I'm saying the population under the null hypothesis of sort of what we're imagining it to be, right? If you don't know the mean or the standard deviation, which would have been the case in our earlier example of depressed people with Prozac, depressed people without Prozac, we wouldn't actually know the mean of that population of depressed people without Prozac. So sort of hypothetically, we wouldn't know that, right? So we'd have to estimate it. Okay, what do you think your best way to estimate some population mean is if you don't know it? This was in an earlier slide. I mentioned it would come back up. I don't know, on average, how happy depressed people are. I don't have access to the population of depressed people. What should I do? Take the mean of the sample? Yeah, absolutely. Pull out what I think is a representative sample. Calculate the mean of that sample. The mean of that sample is going to be our best guess for the mean of the population. Right? Does that make sense? OK. So the mean is estimated from a control group, right? However, the standard deviation is actually estimated from the standard deviation of both samples. Unless you have some reason to believe that your two samples are going to have really different variants, or if you observe it, you measure them, you're like, oh my god, that's 10 times the variance of the other one. So I told you this could be an issue, right? The standard deviation thing can become an issue because right here, you don't want to estimate the standard deviation just from your control group because you actually have more information. You can get a better estimate than just the, the estimate from the control group, right? You can get the estimates from both groups as long as we think that the population is spread out more or less the same as the samples are spread out. So you don't want to throw that information away. You want to sort of just lump them together. So the only difference here between the last one, there's two differences. One is notice that mu is now replaced by the mean of group two your control group, right? And notice that in the bottom we have S pooled. S pooled roughly, so, but S pooled variance is calculated by basically crunching together the variance from both of your samples. Does that make sense? Okay. An independent sample as though it's totally agnostic on within versus between subjects. Well, it's a between subjects design. Um, so you can imagine, like, with this class, I want to know how fast, how many people can, how many apples you can eat, or how many oranges you can eat in an hour. And so one thing I do is, be like, all right, everyone in this class, come in today, you have an hour, go. See how many oranges they can get. They come in the next day, exact same people. How many more, how many apples can you get? Go. Versus I have this class do apples and then that class do oranges. And so when I'm wanting to make the comparison, that's a within a between subjects versus the within subject. So if it were a within subject mm -hmm. comparison, you would use a paired samples okay. t test. If it point. were a between subjects comparison, you would use the independent samples t test. And if you wanted to do some weird amalgamation of both, you have to do a mixed model ANOVA. Which we're going to come to. Yeah. The paired samples. If you if you if you want to compare 
within samples. So like pre-test, post-test, but it's the same person taking the test. Uh -huh. That's a paired samples t-test, which is coming up on the next slide. Okay. If you want to compare between two groups, so one group of people takes pre-test, one group of people takes post-test, that's independent samples t-test. And if you want to do some weird in-between thing, like I want to see one group of people takes both pre-test and post-test, and then another group takes some other test, that's what's called a mixed model ANOVA, which just means it's mixed model because it's between and within, sort of jammed into the same um, test. Okay. We're going to cover that also. So, so the apples and oranges, you guys do apples, they do yep. oranges, see if there's a difference, independent samples. Up to this point, yeah. all that we've done is comparing groups like that. Either you're comparing a group to a known population, or you're comparing two groups to each other. We haven't yet compared people to themselves. However, it's a great lead in to uh, paired samples t-test. Also known as a dependent samples t-test or within subjects t-test. What it means that it's dependent samples, right? Paired samples is pretty clear that, that if you, each person takes both measures, right? Like a pre-test and post-test. Like I gave you guys all tests when you walked into class today, and then I give you a test when you walk out of class today, right? I can pair all those up because it's not as though you need to compare the pre-test and the post-test scores. You can compare how people are doing relative to themselves, right, later. It's called dependent samples because if you did poorly on the pre-test, you're probably going to do poorly on the post-test, or at least more so than average. If you did better on the pre-test, you'll probably do better on the post-test, more so than average. So they depend upon each other. They're not independent measures. Within subjects, it just means that you're measuring things within one person rather than between two people. Right? Does this make sense?